Ignatius Press and the Augustine Institute present The Formed Book Club. Catholic book lovers unpacking good books chapter by chapter. If you like us, please help us by subscribing and by reviewing us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you might listen. And don't forget to sign up for weekly updates and study questions at formedbookclub.ignatius.com. Welcome to the Formed Book Club. If you're new or forgotten who we are, uh, this is Vivian Dudro, or as Siri says, Dudro, uh, senior editor of Ignatius Press. I'm Father Fessio, the editor. We have a companion here, Joseph Pierce, uh, who's coming to us from South Carolina. And we continue to discuss, I'll read the box book, The Church, Paradox and Mystery. And uh, last time we left off, just prior, I believe, to page 36, uh, and I have something at the top of that page, so I will, I will quote it. Uh, Even with scriptural warrant and due correction, an image or analogy is always inadequate. You're speaking here especially about the primary image that was kind of brought to the foreground in Lumen Gentium, the Second Vatican Council's document on the Church of the People of God. And his point is, in both mystery and paradox, that you no one analogy, no one image will be adequate to comprehend and understand the fullness of a mystery, which the church is because it's rooted in Christ. Uh, he continues then, all it ever does, that is the image or analogy, is portray one aspect of greater or lesser importance of the mystery and even when freed from error by refinement, still does not penetrate to the inter integral truth. An image is practicable, but even when duly purged of inadequacies, its best function is to complete another image or images. So he, he, he's not uh, trying to diminish the value of the people of God image. But he is trying to correct against what happened after the council, an excessive reliance on this as sort of the primary image of the church, which could be seen as democratic and non-hierarchical. You know, the people is sort of like a mob. And then on the next page, 37, we have a long quote from Yves de Monchoy. Yves de Monchoy uh, was a Jesuit priest who died quite young in his 40s, I believe, uh, in the Vercors in France, which is an eastern mountainous part of France, central France. Uh, during the Second World War, he was part of the resistance, not so much as resisting himself, but he celebrated mass for those who were resisting the German occupation. And he was discovered or betrayed and executed. But it's worth both for what he says and for the wonderful person he was, to quote what he says here, uh, we must not see in this incoherent outburst of confused ideas, that is, all these images of the church, temple, spouse, body, people of God, and so on, only the research, result of research or of assorted individual insights. Since they are found in the sacred authors, or else are consecrated by tradition, with a capital T, they concur to make up a well-knit whole. Without a doubt, the link binding them is not of a logical nature. It would be vain to think of reducing one to another or organizing them into a system. From this logical point of view, we must say that they cannot be reduced to one another, but they all have to contribute to give us an idea not an exhaustive idea, but one which will be at least sufficient with a view to behavior of what the church is. There is not one of them which does not in its own way clarify the attitude we must have towards the church and the place we must make for her in our lives. We are allowed to choose some favorite point of view, but no one of them can be neglected with impunity. And now this is has been quite subtle here too because in order to correct a current contemporary problem, he wants to make sure that he's not just responding in a reactionary way. He's going back to a previous statement of someone who was really authorized to speak, 
to show that we've always known that we can't take any one image and let it become too dominant. And so that's what he's doing here. I love the line right after that quote of de Lubach. This, in fact, was the line taken by the council. So he's saying, this is just not the private opinion of one man. This is actually what the council also believed and expressed. Exactly. At the same time, the, the council's multiplicity of images was often then uh, filtered by the media into the one image which they liked the most. Right. And what he's saying, this is a mystery. We have to approach it from different angles. And by the way, another expression of this is what Balthasar calls Kreisen des Denken, circling uh, thinking. It's okay. like the ex big example is the statue of David, David in Florence, you know, at the Academia there. Uh, you, you, can't, you can't just look at that statue. You've got to walk around it. And no one perspective is going to give you the whole statue. Uh, so it, it's the Christ in his thinking, circling thought, to say the multiple images which point to something beyond any one image or even any com combination of images, which gives us kind of the, uh, the, the best appreciation we can have of what the church is. And to bring in the paradoxical element, uh, on 39, the Lubach talks about these dialectical pairs of images that not only do you have this multiplicity of images and they all contribute something to the whole, you also have paradoxical pairs that seem to contradict each other and they have to be kept together in some kind of unity. And he spells out what they are, that the church is of God and is of men, that the church is visible and invisible, and that the church is of this earth and this time and eschatological and eternal. And then he spends the next several pages spelling out how these things that seem like opposites are actually different facets of the same truth. I, I've also plucked you know, the same discussion uh, to this is that he, one way that he tries to address the caricaturing of the people of God by those who have filtered out what the what the council teaches, is to to re-emphasize or re-accentuate the image of the church as the mystical body of Christ. So three very quick instances here. Um, page 36, two-thirds two of the way down. Her union with her spouse is so intimate that she is his body, and we consequently become his members. And then on page 39, she is the incarnation continued. And then page 40, she is, after all, the spouse of Christ and his body. So the other approach he's taking is, yes, he's discussing the people of God image, but he's also reminding us, right, of, of other images that should not be downplayed or forgotten or neglected because of that. Yes, and in, in the very sections of this chapter, he will cover some of those images uh, precisely to do that, Joseph. And I... I know there's many thinkers we could call dialectical. Of course, people think of Hegel with respect to that. But I think of Chesterton and what you said earlier, Joseph, about paradox. I mean, that's also uh, another way of speaking of dialectical theology or dialectical or perspectival views is to, to have paradox, which things which seem to be somewhat in opposition actually converging uh, in some way. Yeah, I, I thank you for that, because I've never actually made that, What now, now you've said it, obvious connection, that, you know, that Chesterton's understanding of paradox is, is uh, uh, one thing, another thing that contradicts it, so thesis, antithesis, that point to a deeper truth, synthesis, which is exactly Hegelian, and I don't know why that, which is so obvious when you put it that way, <laughs> has not struck me before, but there you are, so, so thank you for that. Well, and it's a classic example of just because Hegel said it doesn't mean it's not true. You know, <laughs> exactly. it, 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 you know, sometimes these brilliant men, they do they are grasping and seeing and perceiving something that's true. 
It's just that where they run with it might be in the wrong direction. You know what I mean? I agree with you. I think the problem with Hegel, he makes that the centre of all, all, all historical mechanisms. You know, and that's the problem. It becomes it becomes the god rather than just one way of seeing the truth. That's exactly what he does. He turns history and the dialectical processes in history into God himself. He's so he's making another god. And anyway, yes, that's where the problem lies. But the fact that these opposites actually balance each other out and rub each other and, and everything. I mean, this is part of how we perceive the truth. Well, and it's not as if Hegel, by being older than Chesterton, was the first one to bring about or express this idea. It's a very traditional idea uh, called the threefold way, the cataphatic, the apophatic, and via eminentia. That is to say, you say of God, God is just. That's cataphatic. That's making the positive statement. But he's not just like we are. You know, we, we can't limit him to our view of justice. That's the apophatic. That is speaking away from it. And God is, is the combination of those which we cannot fully grasp. It's like, it's like two arrows pointing up into the clouds, and we can't see what's above those clouds because God is a mystery. But this, this whole idea of, of dialectical or cataphatic, apophatic thinking or, uh, or paradoxical thinking is rooted in all the great thinkers of antiquity and Christianity. Uh, that's one beautiful thing about what the Lubach does. He's not inventing a new theory. He's not speaking as someone with a, with a brilliant idea he just came up with. No, he's kind of crystallizing or distilling what the fruit is of a long history of both Christian and even pre-Christian reflection and thought. Uh, well, actually, hmm, that sort of covers what this chapter does from now till the end. Right. The three different dialectical pairs that yes. you mentioned. And, and, and before, but before we leave it, Okay. This this top of page 44, I think, is one of the most beautiful set of oh, passages yeah. in the entire chapter. Um, what we shall affirm is that the church mysteriously transcends the limits of her visibility. This is where he's talking about the dialectical pairs of being both visible and invisible. That by her very essence, she carries herself, as it were, beyond itself, herself. As Hans Urs von Balthasar has explained it, the church is not the spouse of Christ, nor will she be recognized as such, except in that overreaching which is her love. In what is most urgent and intimate in it, Christian love reaches far beyond what we generally refer to as Christianity. And yet this very reaching beyond, we must add with von Balthasar, is Christianity itself. Yeah, and that is beautiful, but it leads into the one the one thing I wanted to quote from this chapter before we do leave it in that case, because it, uh, he, he's, he's talking about the fact that we, we can't encapsulate the church uh, in one of these phrases, right? But um, the transcendental nature of it, the transcendent nature of it, uh, page 46, in the last analysis, towards the bottom, in the last analysis, we must declare simultaneously that A, our church is a militant one, so the church militant. She lives on this earth in a constant and truceless war waged with the forces of light against ever recurring evil. So there is no ultimate um, uh, accommodation with the zeitgeist. It's a truceless war. The city of God, the city of man. Um, and that B, she is already, already here below that haven of peace, that dwelling place of God, who in, who in St. Bernard's phrase, tranquillus tranquillat omnia, which maybe Father will translate for me. Uh, being tranquil, she makes all things tranquil. Or being peaceful, she makes all things peaceful. Right, so we have this idea that the church is at one hand a, a church at war, right? We're Milus Christi, we're soldiers of Christ. But at the same time, within the church, because the church is just not, not just the church militant, but also the church triumphant, that there is this peace 
that passes the understanding of the world, which is part of who she is in her essence. And so that, so that, the, the fact he's sort of saying, oh, we can talk about all these things, but ultimately we have to understand that the church is the mystical body of Christ. The church is the church triumphant. It's the church in heaven, uh, it's, it's, it, as well as, <laughs> not instead of, you know, the church struggling, suffering down here on earth and purgatory, wherever. But and there's, there's, there's two, <clears throat> if you will, directions of transcendence. And Vivian mentioned the first, and you mentioned the second. The one you just mentioned, Joseph, is the church is both temporal and eternal, so it transcends time, and the church militant is, is connected with the church trumpet and the church suffering and purgatory. That's the vertical transcendence. But the previous one that you read has to do with the horizontal transcendence. The visible church, you can look up in the on the internet where your parish is and who the bishop is and who the pastor is and who's baptized in the register. That's the visible church. But by its love, which is Christ's love, it already transcends itself. And so there's there's actually there's no part of humanity and no part of the cosmos which is not in some way mysteriously embraced by the church's transcendent love. That, that, that's the mystery. It's beautiful. It's also beautiful, Father, the way you encapsulated the vertical and the horizontal of transcendence there, so thank well, you. Well, and let's not forget, love goes in both directions. I mean, part of the overreaching of the church's love is the overreaching of the church's love for God and Christ her spouse. In other words, what, what are we not willing to sacrifice for the love of Christ? It, that also is a overreaching what we consider our limits to be in addition to the love we show one another. I mean, I think love goes, cuts both ways. It goes both ways, yeah. Yeah. In fact, if it doesn't go both ways, it won't go either way. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good apparition. That's good. That's, so, good. that's a good way to conclude that, this chapter. Good. Is that... We will conclude in this chapter. Yes. How is the Church of Mystery? Uh, I think so. And then before we go to the next chapter, which is Lumen Gentium and the Fathers of the Church, uh, Joseph, you mentioned a couple of times that you know your your interest, your background, your training uh, is more literature than theological. But how uh, how accessible or comprehensible would you find this as someone whose background is literature entering into someone who is really theological? Well, I, I mean, having having obviously read this chapter, there, I think it's, it's no, the, I, the previous, I, no, the previous chapter, up, 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 so far. Have I you learned any? Have you, have you learned anything? Is what I'm asking. I, I've, I've learned a great deal. In fact, you know, having read it by myself and then having discussed it with you two, uh, I've, I've realized how little I understood it when reading it myself. Um, I've now, if you like, I'm getting up to speed a bit. I now know what the Lubeck's doing and how he's thinking. It's making things a bit easier for me. I would say with this chapter, however, there is a problem, and it, but I think it's a subjective problem. Uh, I, I like literature because I like um, yeah, I like stories and I like just gazing in wonder at beauty. Right, that's why I like literature. This is quoting scripture, and it's one quote from a father of the church, and for scripture, father of the church is just quote after quote after quote, uh, and it's just not the mode by which I'm with which I'm comfortable uh, as regards engaging with reality. So uh, there's nothing wrong with the text. The problem, if it's a problem, uh, you know, the issue is with me, right? So, um, so I have read it and I've got a great deal out of it and I'm expecting to get much more out of this chapter following up my, my discussion with both of you. But, uh, but, the, but uh, I, it's a point at which I know there's, he's so, he's so, he's so learned, right? He's such a scholar. That in one paragraph, he's quoting just three words from about eight people, right? And at some <laughs> point, I begin to glaze over, you know, I, I, whatever he's trying to say, the way he's saying it is just overloading me. Um, right. That's just, that's probably just me, you know? Well, and, and that may be a legitimate a weakness or failing in the way he presents things, but let me give a little preamble here of, I believe, why he's doing this. Uh, Joseph and Vivian, you're probably too young, both of you, uh, to have really experienced directly this idea that came about after the Vatican Council. Oh, the church is divided into pre-Vatican II, which is old and bad and outmoded, 
and post Vatican II, which is new and beautiful. And finally, we, the shackles of history have been taken off of us, you know. And what he's doing right after the council is this is written, this is sixty nine. I think he's writing this around that time. Uh, is he's showing that the council did nothing new. That is to say, nothing totally invented. Everything which the council taught, especially in her most central documents like Lumen Gentium and De Verbum uh, and Gaudium et Spes, uh, what in Sacrosanctum of the Church to come, uh, was rooted in the church's history and especially the fathers of the church. That is, those who are progenitors, because you've got Christ who sums up the Old Testament, you've got the Gospels, you've got the apostles and the evangelists, and then you have this period of youthful reflection, prayer, contemplation, uh, philosophical analysis of what's been revealed to us by God, and there's a tremendous explosion of insight there. And this was, in a certain sense, collected by the scholastic period, especially Thomas Aquinas, who was greatly indebted to the fathers. And then through church history, some things got more or less emphasized and some were de-emphasized. The council basically was trying to look back at the whole Christian treasury of thought, if you will, in life, and resummarize it, represent it in a way that would be comprehensible to a more modern audience. Yeah, but so what you're saying, it sorry. wasn't it wasn't it wasn't a break from tradition. It was a continuity of tradition with a renewed ability to express that in ways that might reach people better. There was a wonderful so it's what Ratzinger and 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 uh, 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 Ratzinger basically talked about this different distinguish between the hermeneutic of continuity and the hermeneutic of rupture, uh, yes. and uh, he he was arguing the same thing that ultimately there is no hermeneutic rupture in the council. It's only in the in the modernistic or uh, the modernist interpretation of the council that this hermeneutic of rupture exists. And the other thing I want to say, and I will let you speak, Vivian. Sorry, but I want to I want to stress rather that I I, I wasn't suggesting there's a problem with the Lubeck's quoting of all these fathers. I was saying this is a subjective issue of mine. It's not the way, it's not the mode by which I choose to engage with truth. Um, that's not that's not a criticism to Lubeck. It's not necessarily a criticism of me, it's an issue with me. Whether it's a failing or not is a, is a, yeah. is a moot point. It's like, it's like myself with ballet. I think ballet is wonderful, or opera even more so. It's, it's glorious, but I, I just can't, I don't appreciate Opera, like I appreciate a good book, you know, uh, or exactly, music. exactly, yeah, exactly. So this and is it's a not, subjective, it's yeah. subjective comment. It's not objective criticism. But there's, there's not something wrong with ballet, you know, no. or opera. I I would like to draw attention to I, what I think is a very important set of passages All right. that brings more explanation to what Father just said about what De Lubach is doing in showing that the council is echoing the fathers of the church, that generation who were evangelized by the evangelists, right? The, 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 the sons, if you will, of the apostolic age were the fathers of the church to show that the, uh, what the council is doing is actually rooted all the way back to that and, and scripture, okay? But this, this set of lines that begins on 49, I think is so important to understand. But here it is important to distinguish carefully between two epithets that tend to be confused. Conservative does not mean traditional. It could mean the exact opposite. On the important issues, the ecclesiology of Lumen Gentium, far from conserving them, overthrows certain positions formally held by a school that could, on occasion, almost be considered official. Its reason for doing this, however, were to uncover or reestablish more firmly views with more authentic basis and tradition. That I had to align too, because insofar as the council was a break, it was a break with a kind of an ossified 
tradition that 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 had obscured what had gone before. So it was actually kind of a reconnecting to the past. Uh, Joseph, I have a little anecdote which kind of which will uh, be appropriate to what you just said about reading Zubach, where he quotes you know eight different people for, for three words, or whatever. I remember once. <laughs> Going to do the Bible. I just read one of his books. You know, like if you look at a, a typical page, like oh, I mean, page fifty six and fifty seven, one fourth or one third of that page is footnotes, right? Mm -hmm. Well, this is not one of his scholarly works. With his scholarly works, it'd be two thirds of the page of footnotes. So I, I just read one of his new books, and I came, I just came to thank him for them. Oh, there's nothing new there. It's just all quotes. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, yes. That's like Rembrandt saying, well, there's nothing new there. It's all those paints in the tube there, you know. But he, he takes these little quotes from all over the tradition, largely well-known people and less, not so well-known people, and he make, he's making a portrait out of those things, which is yes. very beautiful. Yes, and he even uses this word rupture. If you continue on here, um, in this case, as in others, the reform envisioned by the council does not, therefore, represent a complete upheaval in the present life of the church, nor does it desire a rupture with all that is essential and long established in tradition. Rather, it is an homage paid to this tradition while wishing to rid it of all that is invalid or defective in it, thereby restoring its authenticity and fecundity. In particular, and that was a quote by, from Paul VI at the opening of the council. In particular, it is clear that the promulgated text is in harmonious accord, both in spirit and letter with the teachings of the fathers of the church. And that, yeah, absolutely. That, that in, in, encompassing encapsulates, but uh, to go back to my mode of, of understanding, uh, a metaphor employed by J.R.R. Tolkien, the other great theologian, um, you know, he, he said that he did not understand the mania for the so-called purity of the early church, but he didn't understand why the sapling is considered superior to the full-grown tree. Um, but in other words, authentic tradition is from the roots, right through the sap, right up the trunk to the branches. And he does say, a part of the same passage, that of course there are dead branches that need to be lopped off to make the thing grow healthily. So he's not, it's like you talk about ossified traditions, where the church sort of got off on some tangent, which was not part or, or essential or necessary to this, this essential trunk and the life it gives in the leaves and where it comes from the roots. Uh, and of course they can be lopped off. That's not a problem. But you, you know, he says, if you chop down he said, if you chop down the tree looking for the sapling, you don't find the sapling, you kill the tree. Mm -hmm. And that, Joseph, so that's beautiful. That That is an echo of what I said in a previous session here about Balthasar's book on Enfaltung. And as knowledge grows and diversifies and gets in different uh, faculties or disciplines, they can tend to grow away from the trunk mm -hmm. and the roots. Mm -hmm. and. Even when you don't lop off a branch because it's been ossified or whatever is dead, you have to always refer and relate these various uh, branches to the center. And that's why with this book on the church, he basically says the church is Christ or it's nothing. You know? mm -hmm. I say this is a good place to uh, end this session mm -hmm. um, and we'll come back for the next session and continue with this chapter. Mm -hmm. That sound okay? Good. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us and hope to see you for the next session. If you enjoyed this discussion, please help spread the word about the Forum Book Club by subscribing to the podcast and writing a review. You can sign up for weekly updates at formedbookclub.ignatius.com.